Uh, thank you, Vasco. I'm always pleased to get an audience. It still surprises me that people actually turn up to listen. The high point of my career, I lectured on the Greek island of Idra, and I got an audience of six and a cat. <laughs> and the cat left halfway through, so. Uh, could I congratulate the Faculty of Fine Arts, as I would call it, uh, in, in, in the University of Portugal, on what is a very notable initiative through you, Vice Rector. Um, it's been a, an amazing conference for me. I go to quite a lot of conferences and do various bits of speaking. But there are areas I wrote about as a historian, particularly perspective, but generally geometry and art from the Renaissance onwards, which I thought really died in art schools. And I thought the 60s had swept all that away. But it's absolutely amazing at this conference to find there are young people who are seriously teaching perspectival geometry, construct, uh, descriptive geometry, and so on. It's been a, a great delight and a great, a great surprise. So, um, uh, so thank you very much. And I, there was a session afterwards when uh, Vasco was chairing, thinking about what initiatives you could take forward. I hope whatever happens, you will take some, something forward from what has been a, a very notable and, for me, extraordinarily enjoyable occasion. Uh, above all, I think, uh, those of you who have been in the conference and those who haven't been will, uh, will bear with me, I hope, to thank Vasco uh, himself, Vasco Cardozo. Um, it's been an incredible effort. He's been director of the academic program, vice director of the academic program, He's been Director of Administration, Vice Director of Administration, uh, Director of Finance, you know how it goes, um, and Director of Transport. Um, I've been to a lot of conferences, but I've never seen an effort like that. Anyway, it's just fantastic. What I'm going to be doing today is uh, looking at various kinds of geometries. In the uh, conference, we've particularly looked at perspectival spatial geometries, and I'm not really doing that, though I've written about that on the past. But I'm looking at something of the range of geometries, particularly new styles of geometry, above all in relation to nature, order and disorder in nature. It's going to be a very rapid tour, a kind of visual tour, really, um, accompanied by a series of artists I know and some scientists I know and a few I don't know, but uh, it's got a personal dimension to it. As a historian, I find engaging with contemporary artists is sustainedly enriching. Not that you look at the past through the eyes of the present solely, but artists open up fresh perceptions and uh, I've always enjoyed working with and sometimes writing about, uh, 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 about artists. Um, the, what I'm going to be doing is based upon or orbits around a series of books. Vasco has already given a bit of an advertisement for these, but uh, Visualizations, which is the collective uh, collection of the first, I think, seven years of the nature columns I ran. It was a weekly column at one, one point, and uh, that, that is um, quite a struggle. Um, seen Unseen, which uh, is a summary, a joined-up summary of what came out of the Nature Ones. Acts of Seeing, which was a series of essays published for me, as it were. And I'm showing you that because uh, Harry Croto contributed an essay. And I'm going to be looking at Harry Croto, the Nobel Prize winner of uh, Carbon 60, the Buckyball Man. Um, anyway, that's advertising Harry's... Um, Harry's uh, essay in that, and most recently a series of lectures I gave at University of Virginia called Structural Intuitions, and I'll just introduce that concept. I don't want to pretend it's some kind of great magic secret which we can, you can throw at science and art and it explains everything, but for me it's a handy shorthand for thinking about how artists and scientists perceive order and disorder in nature and what they subsequently do with it. And that's really what this, this lecture is going, going to be about. Um, one of the things that drew me into biology was shape. Um, I wasn't particularly good at uh, mathematics. I was OK at geometry. Um, but the mysteries of shape and the echoes and resonances of shape 
Um, this is on my pine dining table. It's obviously a walnut and a little chocolate Easter egg. And I've always been fascinated by why these shapes echo each other, how they come about, what processes have led to these shapes. In scientific terms, these may be trivial. There may be no real link between a walnut shell and not in a pine table and, a, and an Easter egg, or there might be. But for an artist, these are immensely enriching things, these slightly irresponsible splashing across these, these various areas. And that, to some extent, is what I'm going to be doing today. I can introduce structural intuitions with an artist I know, Jonathan Callan. I haven't seen for a year or two, but anyway. Um, I went into his studio at one point, and he had a sieve, um, the sort of thing you use for flour, and he was sieving uh, white powder onto a board with a series of holes in it, irregularly spaced. Um, and of course, the powder was dropping through the holes, and it was standing up proud of the holes in certain points. That's the model. That's, it. That's his test one. You can see what's happened, that the there are a series of little mountains formed underneath the board, but he was interested in what was happening on top. And he developed that into quite large-scale installations, some of them wall size. You walked across a, a plank and looked at this extraordinary landscape. He calls them dust landscapes. And they're really magical, aren't they? Um, the, there's a sense of what scale are they, for, first of all? They could be microscopic, very enlarged microscopic images. They could be ge geological images. Um, and so on. Um, the one on the top corner shows one which is in a kind of concrete vat. Uh, but I was absolutely fascinated uh, by these. I, I said to him, Jonathan, what are you doing? He said, I'm sieving powder through this. And I said, yeah, I can see that. But he said, I'm just fascinated by the way these forms organize themselves. And this is a self-organizing system. And I said to him, do you know about the science of, uh, of criticality? of self-organized criticality. That's the, sci the, the, that's the science of, of sand piles and other things like traffic jams and so on. When a system becomes critical at the point it's likely to collapse or have an avalanche, um, and it's unpredictable. Even quite small computer models of a sand pile, um, the, the phenomenon is unpredictable. Uh, uh, but obviously, there's a critical angle at which it's likely to occur, but you cannot predict, cannot predict it. He said, no, I hadn't heard about that. He was interested in it, but it didn't matter to me whether he'd heard about it or not. He got it, or he got self-organized criticality by dint of a kind of intuition as to how interestingly these, beha these, materials, um, these materials behaved. Um, they tend to be scaleless on the top left, I think you can get the sense that's not very large, but it could be large. It could be pretty enormous. On the right is something I was lecturing in Pompano Beach in uh, California, and each morning a beach bum came out and built these sand piles. And he had some water to squirt on them to stop them from blowing away, which uh, slightly upset the calculations of self-organized criticality because it's making, the, making it more adhesive. But people walked past each day and they were fascinated to see his sand piles, how they reacted as they dried out, they avalanched. Um, and uh, there is a kind of fascination with that. It's, it, it's that sense that there's something very, very strange, very interesting, very mysterious about these, um, these forms, of, uh, forms in nature. Um, you could take it further. Uh, 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 an Italian photographer, Lupo Tomboli, has just issued a series of very brilliant, very abstract photographs of, uh, of sand in the desert. This is obviously a complex phenomenon because you've not just got the self-organized criticality of the sand pile, you've also got wind. And you could look at that and think it looks like a fold. Um, I'm going to be looking at folding um, later on in, in, in the talk. In fact, for a, these are quite different phenomena. A fold is a thin membrane which is folded, and this is uh, a particulate substance. So they're, they're different, but it's the sort of thing you can look at and get that resonance without it necessarily carrying any uh, clear scientific message. Anyway, to come back to the nature piece, uh, I'd, uh, I wrote up the, this in my nature column, 
talking about self-organized criticality and the way that Jonathan Callan was creating these amazing dust landscapes. And an astronomer wrote in, Adrian Webster, who was astronomer royal in Edinburgh, and he said, oh, what we're looking at here are Vor Voronoi cells, named after the Russian mathematician. And the way they work, you can see on the diagrammatic one on the left, if you have a series of holes, there are one, two, three, four, five holes there, um, and you can work out which hole a particular particle will go down. It could be a hole, it could be a vacuum or whatever, but the particles have a tendency to go, and they have boundary conditions. If they're nearer one hole, they will go to that hole, and, and so on. And if you work out the boundaries between, which determine which holes these things go down, they, they're cellular. And these are the Voronoi cells. Um, and they have a certain kind of geometry to them, which I think is rather beautiful in itself. I'd already said to Jonathan, look at it from above. It looks like a series of, of cells. Um, and Adrian Webster did a computer version of it, which you see on, on the right there. Now, why was a cosmologist, why was an astronomer interested in this? Because one of the models they were considering for galaxies is that they're on the walls of a Voronoi foam. Um, I thought this was just wonderful. I mean, I didn't know anything about that at all. But it's one of these things where you get an intuition, an artist is, is working with something, and says, wow, that's interesting, let's see what happens. And I got self-organized criticality. We then got from Jonathan's cement powder sieved, we got into cosmic, cosmic um, speculation about the nature of galaxies. Just fantastic. Um, partly intentional, but partly just sheer, sheer delight of um, where, things, where things lead. And that's what I mean by structural intuitions, that an artist or a scientist or anyone can look at a phenomenon and say, oh, look at that. You know, something's happening there. Uh, very often the starting point is that sort of slightly, almost a somatic sense of, wow, well, yes, it's fantastic what's happening there. And you then go on to do something with it. Jonathan Callan did something with it with his cement powder. Um, Adrian Webster had done something with it in terms of, um, in terms of, the, theory of uh, the theory of galaxies. Um, very different. Obviously, what the artists and scientists do with the intuitions is, is, a, is a very different kind of thing. On the intuitions, my all-time absolutely favorite quote is, by, is from Einstein. Um, which I think I need to pick this up to read this while, rather than bending down. Uh, Jacques Hadamard had written around to a whole series of scientists about the psychology of scientific invention. It's a wonderful series of, le of letters, if you're interested. Um, Einstein didn't quite answer Hadamard's questions, but came up with this absolutely spectacularly wonderful formulation. The words or language, by the way, that's Einstein when he was doing his important work. Um, we all see Einstein now with gray hair and so on. Um, when he was doing important work, he looked like a, looked like a kind of nerd in a, in a patent's office, which is what he was. Um, the words or language, as they're written or spoken, do not seem to play any role in my mechanism of thought. The psychical entities which seem to serve as elements in thought are certain signs and more or less clear images which can be voluntarily reproduced and combined. There is, of course, a certain connection between those elements and relevant logical concepts. It is also clear that the desire to arrive finally at logically connected concepts is the emotional basis of this rather vague play with the above-mentioned elements. But taken from the psychological viewpoint, this combinatory play seems to be in the essential feature in productive thought before there is any kind of connection with logical construction in words or other kinds of signs which communi communicated to others. I and mean, that's absolutely structural intuitions. And my, my sense of it is it's pre-verbal and it's pre-visual. It's, it's something which happens at an absolutely fundamental level and, and very rapidly turns into, uh, in, into other, um, other forms of expression. But there is that moment when, to use the cliche, the penny drops. And uh, that, that Einstein statement, I think, is, is totally magical. In the course of the lecture, having introduced those things, I'm going to be looking at a number of types of 
science and art, different types. Um, they relate to some extent to the Structural Intuitions book, um, but I'll be picking out uh, one or two themes which I looked at in that. The first chapter was indeed on geometrical bodies, which in the conference we spent a deal of time encountering in one form or another. Um, sp spirals, ripples, splashing and folding. Uh, those are the kind of headlines of that. Uh, first, geometrical bodies. Um, the Platonic solids and their variants, the Platonic solids and their truncated form, the Archimedean solids, um, these forms which have exercised their magic over the ages and for Plato corresponded to the fundamental building blocks, the elements and the, of, the, uh, of the universal system. This is by Julian Vossandre, who I'll be, I'll be coming back to, but it's just a, a label to start this exploration. Um, my topics tend to have a Leonardo beginning point. Um, he's immensely rich in anticipating in some way um, so many of the things that happened. In the center is his illustration of a truncated dodecahedron or an icosi dodecahedron illustrated for Luca Pacioli's book De Divina Proportione in manuscript in 1498 and published in 1509. And it's the only Leonardo illustrations published in his own lifetime. And he devised this technique of showing them as solid bodies, but very characteristically for Leonardo, also found a way of getting the skeleton, as it were, right, the fenestrated form, so you can see through the, the, the open windows, as it were, the fenestration of this, to see the actual structure actual structure behind. I think something very interesting happens when they adopt physical form like this. Um, when they become made in wood or if they're just implied as solid things. This is a regular body, but of course the light and shade on it are accidents. Um, and if you look on the left, there's uh, an illustration from Luca Pacioli's earlier book, his Summer Day Arithmetica, etc. And you can see there they, they're diagrammatic. That's a conceptual illustration of a conceptual thing. What Leonardo does is to turn the conceptual thing into a perceptual thing. And it has a completely, completely different feel. And on the right is a, is a page in which he's manipulating these forms as a kind of mental sculpture. He obviously had an extraordinary ability to manipulate these shapes in, in his mind. I can do it a bit, but uh, looking at him, he, he does it to an, an awesome degree. Um, this is the portrait of Luca Pacioli by Jaco de Barbary, and here you see the solids realized on a dodecahedron on the, on the book on the right, uh, probably in wood. And then this very beautiful glass one, which seems to be half full of water. We know he made these models for the Florentine Signoria, and they, held, they, were, they, they were suspended in, in the government room in the uh, Sala del Consiglio, whether they're meant to make the uh, Florentine councillors think better thoughts, I don't know, but um, uh, they were realized in physical form. And with the accidents of light and shade, the transparency and so on, they don't lose their regularity, but they gain an element of irregularity, of chance, of contingency, which, um, which, is, uh, which is very nice. And I think Leonardo couldn't do geometry unless he got it into plastic form. You could only do it if it became sculpture. Um, he, 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 he didn't have much sense of doing it flat. Um, for the Leonardo exhibition at the uh, Victorian Albert Museum, uh, Steve Maher, who's a kind of genius of these things, and I'm going to be working with him on a computer-generated image of uh, Leonardo's Battle of Anghiari, did a series of animations, and this is the one of the... Uh, key which lets that animation run, but we seem to have lost it. Nope, the animation isn't going to work. Anyway, it's a very spectacular animation. <laughs> um, following Leonardo, and particularly the publication of the... Um, uh, I'll try and play this at the end, uh, if, if, if we don't run too much over time, as it certainly is worth seeing. Um, the regular bodies became kind of five-finger exercises for perspectivists. A lot of the perspective treaties, Daniele Barbaro and so on, did this. The one I'm showing you here is probably the most 
remarkable of the uh, perspective of treatises centering on the, fi on the five regular bodies with their variants. This is Wenzel Jamnitzer, his uh, perspective of the regular bodies in 1568, a German uh, silversmith, um, a very remarkable sculptor in a whole range of materials, and a life caster of animals. It's a fascinating character. And these are incredible, aren't they? They're kind of platonic solids as jazz. Um, just extraordinary f fertility of imagination. Um, we'll, we'll see a scientific example which uh, rather picks up on that kind of thing. And probably the most spectacular immediate legacy of it was Kepler's system for the planetary uh, orbits in Mysterium Cosmographicum, a book published 1496 uh, 97 And he had noted that if you took the uh, platonic solids, the five platonic solids, you inscribe them in a sphere and you just successfully ne nest one inside the other, that you have a system in which the ratios of the orbits of the planets are uncannily accurate. Kepler later came up with elliptical orbits, so this is a but even then, he, he still clung to that and said the ratios express that even if it's not the physical reality, that it's a, a mathematical reality that God's design, as it were, even if you've got elliptical orbits, the ratios work according to that system. This is an absolutely spectacular object. It was to be made in metal. It was to be clockworked, so it would actually move. And he at one point suggested that the... Uh, you could have alcoholic beverages in the hollow tube, tubes of this, the hollow components of this corresponding to the, the deity that they represented. It would have been a wonderful great court structure. Um, perhaps someday we should find somebody to make it. It would be just, uh, uh, just extraordinary. Um, and then uh, jumping down a scale, hugely down scales, but to a modern one, uh, carbon-60 buckyballs um, invented by or devised or discovered by Harry Croto and the team at Rice University in the top right-hand corner. Harry Croto is the guy in the, in, in the blue shirt. And they knew from the chemistry, from their examinations, that there was a way that you should be able to get 60 carbon atoms in a coherent molecule rather than flat sheets, which it would normally come in. And Harry had been, he wanted to be a designer as a young man. He wanted to be a graphic designer. He has terrific powers of visualization and, and, and draws rather well. Anyway, they had this, these 60 atoms to sort out. Harry, as a young man, had been to Expo 67 in Montreal, and he'd seen Buckminster Fuller's uh, Dome of the American Pavilion. Um, which has survived a fire, so it, it's there as a gaunt but very expressive, uh, very expressive skeleton in the middle of an island on, uh, in the St. Lawrence. And he looked at that and he recalled the way in which, this is a double shell structure, in the inner shell is of uh, isosceles triangles, the outer shell is of hexagons. And he thought that that sort of system of of tiling a, 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 poly, a polyhedron would work, and he came up with the system of alternating uh, or a, a mixture of uh, p pentagrams and uh, 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 pentagons and, uh, and hexagons to do that. And being an Englishman in America, he recognized it was rather like um, the footballs as they were then used. The footballs now don't quite look like that, um, in which the the, the football, rather than having the sort I use, remember as a kid, it had sort of banana-shaped segments, rather like a globe. Um, this was the sort of tiling that they were using. Um, hence the name Bucky Balls. Um, the, the popular name, the proper proper name for it is Buckminster Fullerene. Um, it's a very Leonardo's kind of insight, but Harry is someone who has those abilities to visualize in three dimensions, which contributed something very real to the Rice, the team in Rice University in America who are credited with the discovery and indeed got the Nobel Prize for it. What they found when they made bigger and bigger fullerenes is that they automatically went irregular. 
There's, there's a, you can see that a, as you're building up these much larger ones, something starts to go wrong. And he went back to the Bankminster Fuller Dome, which was supposedly regular hexagons, and noticed that every so often he'd got an irregular one. He'd actually fudged, as it were, in order to get this perfect, apparent perfection of the, the complete... Uh, the dome made complete, completely from perfect hexagons and underneath from isosceles triangles that, that Fuller had, um, had, had, in a sense, found it necessarily to manipulate some of the, some of the figures to make it work properly. Um, so again, there's this lovely tie-in between Buckminster Fuller, the, uh, his geodesic domes, and what Harry was finding. And there was a continual dialogue between, uh, between Fuller's dome and the, and, and the fullerenes. Fullerenes, we now know they make them in nanotubes and all sorts of things. Um, when Harry and, and the guys discovered it, it was basically an exciting theoretical thing. It wasn't, a, it wasn't part of practicing science. I think we need to remember that about science as well as art, that um, the great discoveries often are made not for economic reasons. They're made because people want to know. And then in... And 2003, this appeared on the cover of Nature, a new system for what was a finite universe on a hypersphere. The hypersphere is on the right there, and the hypersphere's property is you can leave one side and you enter the other side simultaneously, a kind of thing you can't illustrate other than with arrows. This, is, this was from the team in Paris, Jean-Pierre Luminet, uh, the astronomer in Paris at the Paris Observatory, and he was supposing there was a, uh, a, a form of a universal organization which was finite but had this system of, um, of hexagons and pentagons in the same way as the, as the Buckminster Fullerene Domes or one of the Leonardo illustrations. Um, Jean-Pierre Lumine is an extraordinarily interesting man and is much interested in historical antecedents. He knows his way around Jura, he knows his way around uh, the mathematics of perspective he, um, and again like Harry he is one of the kind of artistic visualizers working in science who brings a certain uh, property to it. In all these things I'm not primarily concerned, I'm interested but I'm not primarily concerned as whether the idea is right or wrong. I'm interested in these perpetual tendencies of the human mind to see things in certain ways. Um, so whether the galaxies are organized along the uh, walls of the Voronoi foam is not my chief concern. I'm interested in whether it might be right. I'm interested in these inherent tendencies of the human mind to come up with these similar methods of structuring their intuitions, of uh, organizing what they see. Um, two, arti two artists involved in this. On the top left, you've already seen that, Julio, Julian Voss André, who is a German uh, sculptor. And below these, I absolutely love these. These are platonic solids that have had the air sucked out of them. They go, <laughs> you know, and, and they, 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 they collapse inwards. And in a way, you become almost more aware of the structure. You become aware of the points which sort of hold the whole thing in, in some kind of tension. Um, on the right, accompanied by Jean-Pierre Luminet's um, uh, visualization of the, of the cosmic order, these are by Ai Weiwei. They're in Blenheim Palace, which um, is on the, my house is on the doorstep of Blenheim Palace, as it were. And he produced these ones in wood, which are very beautiful in their own right. But the photograph I've got there in the, in the center at the top I photographed, the, 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 I photographed two of them through each other. And they end up, uh, they end up by looking remarkably like Jean-Pierre Luminet one. Um, uh, you find them all over the place, the geometric solids. They're, they're semi-iconic, not quite as iconic as some of the things I looked at, like the Coke bottle and E equals MC squared, but they have something of an iconic quality. This, when I was lecturing in Cornell, this is Ithaca, and it's a, the window of a fashion shop um, selling, selling stylish clothes, and the style is reinforced by having this... Um, by having, having the geometric solid in, in, or two geometric solids in the window fenestrated. And then 
This is really up to date. This is 19th of April this year, um, the nature, co uh, nature cover. And these are gold nanoparticles which have been encouraged to have a chirality twisted, in other words. So you're essentially taking a, a regular body and you're twisting it using amino acids and peptides to uh, catalyze or, and to organize this, uh, this twisted form. It struck me, looking at some of the bodies we saw in the lectures and the conference, that it would be interesting to take some of those forms and simply twist them and see what happens, give them a chirality. Um, it's this kind of recurrent theme which uh, uh, one picks up, and you find these basic structures uh, appearing again and again in a series of, uh, of manifestations in, in nature, either in, a, in their elemental form or, in this case, in a, in a near-variant near form. Um, second topic is spirals. Um, and I'll, This is Leonardo, as you probably will recognize, and I'll come on, come on to that. Uh, Spirals associated not least with Darcy Wentworth Thompson, the, uh, the Scottish biologist on growth and form. Um, Thompson's book was an interesting, published in 1917, and it dropped out of science, was everybody was concerned with genetics. But it carried on, it had an enormous life in design departments and in architecture schools and so on. And then of course with new modes of computer modeling, the self-organizing properties of uh, Darcy Thompson's forms then come back into science. But for a long time, it was largely sustained by uh, designers, by inspiring people, engineers uh, not least. Um, and what Thompson is doing is looking at the physical factors in organizing form, chemico-physical chemico factors. And again, a quote which will give a sense of how he sees these, these things as happening. The physicist uh, proclaims aloud that the physical phenomena which meet us by way of form, not less beautiful and scarce, less varied than those which move us to admiration among living things, the waves of the sea, the little ripples on the shore, the sweeping curve of the sandy bay between its headlands, the outline of the hills, the shape of the clouds, all these are so many riddles of form so many problems of morphology, and all of them the physicist can more or less re easily read and adequately solve. Solving them by reference to their antecedent phenomena in the material system of mechanical forces to which they belong and to which we interpret them as being due. They also have, doubtless, their imminent teleological significance, but it is on another plane of thought from the physicists that we contemplate their in intrinsic harmony and perfection, and see that they are good. Um, see, seeing they are good is a quotation from, uh, uh, from the Bible, from, from Genesis. Um, it's I say, a vision which now, with computer modeling of forms and forces in nature, has come back, but was totally smothered, really, by genetic causality, where people just said, well, it's just basically genes and proteins, and that's all we need worry about. Lewis Wolpert, the biologist, said precisely that to me. Um, looking at spirals, again a Leonardo starting point, uh, this very famous drawing at Windsor, it's a synthetic drawing, it's not an observation, it's compiled from a series of studies of the phenomena of water circulating within itself and these rosettes of bubbles bursting to the surface, they're all studied separately in an experimental tank. On the left, uh, you can see two little marginal diagrams from the Codex Lester. I'm doing a, an edition of that for Bill Gates, who owns the Codex Lester. And virtually unnoticed until we did the edition, these two little tanks, one is written sperientia, literally exper experience or experiment. And it's got a, a rectangular tank with a little rectangular, uh, it's a rectangular tank, and in his note he says, have a ceramicist make this with glass sides. And it's got a little aperture above it through which you could blow wind or tip water. It's astonishing. This is a laboratory test of a physical phenomenon. I know no nobody doing this beforehand, classical medieval science. He's setting up this experimental tank in his workshop to understand how water behaves. So, of course, it behaves in a remarkably... Uh, remarkably complicated way. 
um, thrusting the, the, the air underneath and excluding upwards in this, in this extra, extraordinary manner. For Leonardo, this was a terrific challenge to cope with the variables in that. And we see the fruits of that across all his work. On the left is a wig for Leda in the last painting of Leda and the Swan. Um, it's a wig, as he says on one of the other drawings, this is going to be taken on and off as you wish. And the human engineer has picked up the, uh, the curving of the hair, the curling of the hair, and exaggerated it and made a kind of perfected version of it. Um, Leda's own hair spouts out from, the ro from these whirls at the centre and dribbles down from the edges. A wonderful sort of harmony between uh, natural movement of hair and the very regimented form of the wig. Leonardo does the back of the wig. Raphael wouldn't have done that. In fact, no sane artist would do that. They want it to look all right from the front, but Leonardo had to work it out and say, you know, I can only do the front of the wig if I understand what happens at the back. Um, in the middle is one of my favourite of all drawings um, uh, with these extraordinary uh, turbulent flows behind, of, a, of a stream which rushes, rushes past these obstacles. And the note says, note how the movement of hair is like the curling of water. The weight of the hair equals the current. The tendency of hair to curl and water to circulate results in a helix. This is a static phenomenon and a dynamic phenomenon. It's not legitimate physics in a way, but it's a wonderful insight to the commonality of uh, form and force in nature. And that detail, many of you, I think, will probably recognize, comes from Mona Lisa. Um, the cascades of hair coming down from her shoulder, the twist of the... Uh, of the translucent shawl and something I really like is little rivulets of drapery that come down from the gathered silk. Her husband was a silk merchant, so um, that partly explains the choice of materials. For Leonardo, you see analogies everywhere. And in a way, this lecture is about analogies. Analogies which might lead somewhere scientifically, might not. But they invariably lead somewhere artistically. Uh, uh, exploring a system which is even more chaotic in the literal technical sense than, uh, than the Leonardo. This is Susan Durgis, an artist who I've worked with a good deal. She was artist in residence at the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford, and they were excavating to make underground spaces, uh, new spaces for the Museum of the History of Science. And the Ashmole, who the uh, Ashmolean Museum is named after, was an alchemist. And they came up with a lot of his alchemic, alchemical equipment, including this, what we would see as a bell jar. And this is Susan Judges making a photogram of, uh, of smoke and fumes moving around inside. Um, extraordinarily beautiful, a very chaotic phenomenon. Um, but, and uh, Susan is extremely well read in a whole series of things like the theories of chaos. Um, so in this case, unlike Jonathan Callan, where it was almost entirely instinctual, here, there's quite a lot of intellectual oomph going into it as well. Um, and two cosmic illustrations of the phenomena, which look rather notably uh, similar, but they're actually, uh, they're actually are made in quite different way. On the left is one of the typical NASA photographs. Um, to justify the expenditure of NASA, uh, one of the outputs they have to have is very spectacular visuals for National Geographic magazine or wherever. And you can go into the NASA website and it's an absolute feast of fizzing, banging images, just uh, amazing. And of course, for th th these are things you can't see. The data is not seeable, it's not optical data, but translating it into this amazing visual form, very typically with these stereotypical little fizzing, um, uh, fizzing light spots as well. Anyway, this is um, this, from the phys physical data. This is a, a visual construction of the ARP gallery. Um, I, for those of you interested, I should have the... Yeah, it's ARP 273. I said to one of my astronomer friends, oh, it's very nice, you should name it after Jean Arc, the great sculptor. But it's named after an astronomer of the same name, which was rather disappointing. On the right, looking rather similar, is a quite different exercise. This is by John Dubinsky, who's a, a Canadian scientist. And this is the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy colliding. Uh, 
And this it takes enormous computing power, even in today's terms, it's enormous computing power. He's, he plots a series of particular points and works out what happens to them, having put in the physical parameters of their behavior. Um, you can look at these John Dubinsky on the web. They're animated, and they are simply awesome. I actually rather prefer them to the NASA ones, which tend to be rather sort of glossy and technicolor for my, for my taste. But here are two images which have enormous visual analogies, but are actually generated in totally different ways, and, um, but you wouldn't necessarily know that looking, looking at them. And then an artist or a, a designer, a landscapist, and an architect, Charles Jenks, who picks up on these sorts of things. This is the Crorick multiverse in the Scottish borders, um, land owned by the Duke of Buccleuch, who owns one of the few Leonardo paintings in captivity. Uh, and it was an open cast coal mine. And the Buccleuchs made a lot of money from mining, including underground mining and open cast mining. Anyway, he decided to reinstate this uh, la barren landscape by commissioning Charles Jenks to make a, a, a great garden. And this is the Crorick multiverse with a series of cosmic images in the landscape. This was the day it opened, so it's now bedded in and is, uh, is much less gravelly looking, but uh, extraordinarily uh, beautiful, and uh, people walk around this and experience the uh, sort of cosmic beauties of the multiverse as, uh, as Charles Jenks has conceived it. Um, and again, just thinking again about uh, the you know, expressing, oh, I should say that um, uh, when this was opened, the Duke of Buccleuch, uh, Richard Buccleuch, organized an absolutely spectacular three-day conference in his castle, um, in, in Drunnamrig Castle, including cosmologists, uh, theoretical physicists, and so on, and a few hangers-on like me. Um, so it's interesting, here is a, a vision of reinstating landscape, uh, then Charles Jenks coming in and thinking of it in those terms, and then triggering one of the highest level meetings of cosmologists, of, uh, uh, of theoretical biologists of the last few years. Um, it's that kind of symbiosis, which is so exciting. And coming down the scale, this is molecular scale, the need for science to express itself visually in ways which is accessible, but I think also deeply appealing to the scientists. Um, this, is, um, this is by Frank Wilczek from his book, um, A Beautiful Question. Um, I reviewed that for the Times Literary Supplement. I think he was rather surprised to find an art historian reviewing a book on the beauty of quantum mechanics, but uh, I have friends in physics, so I just about scraped through. But um, uh, anyway, the, the, the text is very nice in that it gives a sense of how at this quantum mechanics level. Um, he himself is a Nobel Prize winner for studies of quarks, the anomalous theories of quarks. These are very, very high level, um, very high level scientists. Physical at atoms mathematically described are three dimensional objects that will, to the animating spirit of the artist, yield images of exceptional beauty. Here we have a cutaway view, cut view of the electron cloud in a particular excited state of hydrogen for experts, the N -N -N -L -M equals 4 to uh, 1 state. The surfaces of the surface of equal probability. The colors depict the relative phases. Um, a visual real realization of something you can't see is a collection of data, but it's very difficult to uh, communicate that without uh, getting it into visual form. Um, Stephen Hawkins, the illustrated version of that, he resisted that. Malcolm Godwin did an absolutely wonderful job. The illustrated version of Brief History of Time was put together by a book packager. And Hawkins was, was distinctly reluctant. But once he saw how much the uh, diagrams of curved space and so on helped people's visualization and understanding, he was much, um, much reconciled to it. Anyway, in this sort of somewhat irresponsible tour. The next bit is, um, is Ripples. Um, Ripples, uh, Leonardo on the left, again Codex Leicester. Um, 
He was fascinated by ripples. He realized that although they look as if they're moving, he realized that things floating on the surface simply went up and down, that the, 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 there are not currents moving. They, they are ripples like those in a, in a rope which you might shake, a, a skipping rope or whatever. And uh, there you can see um, uh, intersecting ripples. He tried various theories. He couldn't quite get a theory which explained why the waves went along, but they didn't go along, as it were. Um, on the right, again, Susan Durgis. Um, she did a series of photograms of tadpoles, of frog spawn and tadpoles. She's doing not photographs. She's a photograms. They're direct, direct images made with photosynthesis. Uh, sensitive paper without lenses. They're not photographs with lenses, they're just the direct imprinting. And this is very early on in the tadpoles when you're getting little ripples, an absolutely fascinating kind of symphony, including really rather complicated patterns of intersecting ripples which uh, go beyond the circular. And chemical ripples, not just ripples in fluids, uh, a rock on the left there which has in which various minerals have been diffused through the surfaces deposited. And Lee's gang rings, this is from Darcy Thompson's Growth and Form, um, Lee's gang has, uh, discovered that certain chemicals embedded in gelatine would uh, diffuse and precipitate, diffuse and precipitate, causing these rings. And the ratio between the rings is logarithmic. Um, a logarithmic spiral is one of the ones that gets systematically wider rather than just remaining constant. This is not a spiral, this is uh, concent concentric rings, um, but have this logarithmic uh, property, so these are ripples of identity chemistry. And this again is Charles Jenks in his own garden. He's collected up a whole series of rocks with lichen on them. So these are organic growing things which are making these patterns. Um, you can generate them with uh, diffusion and, uh, and precipitation chemically. Um, yeah. And I, I, again, when I started biology, it was this kind of thing that fired me up, the sense that there the were these analogous forms happening. Um, and analogy is, um, is an incredibly important way of thinking. Scientists use analogy a lot in the laboratory. Um, it tends not to get through to the published papers. They say, let's think of this as if it were... Um, and thinking by analogy is very potent. For Leonardo, analogy was proof. Uh, a scientist wouldn't think that now, but they still think with a new phenomenon, it's really uh, by analogy that you can get some initial grasp upon what might be going on. And then an artist friend of mine who I was staying with her in Lisbon last week, Marta de Menethes, who does fascinating work with biology laboratories as an artist, one of her earlier projects was to interfere in the pupae of uh, moths and butterflies with a very fine needle um, just to disturb the development of the ocelli, the, <clears throat> the, ring, the, 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 um, the, the eyes on the wings. And it needs only a touch to completely alter this pattern, and it's a self-organizing pattern. You obviously have a genetic disposition to this, doing this kind of pattern, but the actual pattern itself is much like Lee's gang's rings or the uh, chemical or the staining of the rock. <clears throat> the, 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 bur the butterflies, I, see, uh, I have to say, seem perfectly happy to have these, uh, these somewhat mutated or somewhat manipulated and lived perfect, perfectly normal and, and happy lives. But this is a process of self-organization. You've got the physical chemical parameters are set up and the... And the, the, the the generation of these eye spots then occurs. Um, Thompson was much interested in, in this, and Bateson, who was one of the great discoverers in the early 20th century of Mendel, and was absolutely set upon genetic explanation, nonetheless accepted that the generation of Ocelli, the, the eyes on the wings of, um, of, uh, of butterflies, might be self-organizing. That's not the term he used, because it hadn't been invented. But. And diffusion-limited aggregation, uh, which is just absolutely fantastic. This is um, uh, 
This is by Anthony Hall. There are a series of images him on the, on the web, but it relates to an incredibly famous painter, a uh, paper by Alan Turing, the, the, the man we associate with computing, the chemical basis of morphogenesis, um, enormously much cited, um, 1925 paper. It's cited heavily, I think almost never read. Um, I read it, and it is hideously difficult. It's as difficult as, it's beyond my mathematics. He wrote a two-level paper. He wrote a simpler bit of the paper, which I still struggled with, and the more difficult bit was a write-off. Um, and looking at most of the citations of the paper, most of the people I haven't read it either. But it was looking at the way in which you could take chemical phenomena like this of the diffusion and actually get morphogenesis out of it. The only animal he looked at were, um, were jellyfish. So it's not root, there's not much biology in the paper, it's almost all physics, but an absolutely classic paper. And again, uh, operates in this area, which isn't chiefly about genetic determination, but it's about self-organizing systems. <coughs> when I was lecturing, giving structural intuitions lecture at University of Virginia at the hotel I was staying in, I um, can't remember the name of it now, had a carpet which was almost perfect. Uh, it, it, it's now gone. Fashions change, but uh, did the designer know about this, or is it just that it's a pattern which is almost generates itself if you're working with certain of these squirrely, squirrely designs. Anyway, I don't know the answer to that, and I, I never followed up the research to find out who was the designer of the carpet, which has now bitten the dust or whatever carpets do. Uh, that's decorative, and uh, it's also physics, but it's interesting that some of these images still have a lot of potency in a political in the social context, this is Chris Drury, again, an artist I work with, um, who I greatly admire. Um, and this is at University of Wyoming, and it's called Carbon Sink. And it's thinking about renewables and carbon and so on. And the wood here has been, these are pine uh, trunks which have been killed by a beetle. And the beetle is only surviving because of global warming and the pines are being attacked because of global warming. Anyway, this is installed in the University of Wyoming um, as part of their campus series of sculptures. They've got some pretty good sculptures on canvas. But what happened was that Wyoming is bankrolled in a big way by coal, by gas, by petrol. And the, uh, the president of the university began to receive very irate calls saying, do you know where most of your money is coming from? And the university, um, very disconcerted by this, uh, that um, uh, it survived for a year after which they said it's suffering from water damage and it disappeared. But for me, it's nice because it indicates that a work of art which is, has a social purpose to it can still be inflammatory that something can still play this kind of role. For somebody who thinks that art matters, I like this, because it's, um, it indicates that it can still really make a point, and indeed, in this case, make a point so well that uh, the funders of Wyoming University threatened to withdraw their funds. Um, splashing, uh, in, this, in this, uh, this little tour, um, Again, the, the marginal illustrations from the Codex Leicester, and the, the, the two just above the bottom, the s second and third from the bottom, are interesting. interesting. Leonardo found that whatever shape you dropped into water, it would rapidly produce a circular set of ripples, in, uh, which is counterintuitive in a way. You think triangles might produce triangular ripples, but they don't. Anyway, on the bottom, this little sketch, and Leonardo's amazing, and this little sketch of a, a splash. <laughs> um, and it's, he, he's got it amazingly effective. Um, I don't know of any other artist for a long time doing a splash which has that. There's a little sketch of the pen, just a few uh, twists of the hand and fingers, as it, as it were. But splashes really didn't become very tractable as visual images until stroboscopic photography. Um, on the left, it's probably the earliest and pioneering ones, not as well known as some of the later ones. This is Arthur Worthington, Studies of Splashes in 1908. 
He was the physics instructor at the National Maritime College and was much interested in the movement of fluids. Um, the situation here is, is a ball dropping into milk, which is more viscous and lends itself rather more to, uh, more to being photographed. And this is from Darcy Thompson's Growth and Form. It's not the original Worthington illustration, it's, uh, it's from the Darcy Thompson book. And on the upper right there, you have a page from the Growth and Form by Thompson in which he's looking at this as a physical phenomenon and indeed as a zoological phenomenon. Um, in the top left, you've got uh, splashes. The right one on the, on the top left of that page is a polyp. And he looks at these gelatinous um, sea creatures, and looks at their shapes and sees their splash-like nature. He's not in a position to do much about it. It's just an analogy at this point. On the right-hand side of the page, this is a viscous fluid dropping through non-viscous fluids. And extraordinary branching pattern. And he compares a splash to a potter making a pot. Very nice insight. He says a splash is like a kind of extended pot on a, on a, on a wheel. Um, this kind of uh, uh, thinking by analogy is, um, as you may be able to tell, is something which I find deeply appealing. The, the technicolor image on the bottom right is Edgerton from Strobe Alley at MIT. Some of you may be familiar with his photographs of a bullet going through an apple. Um, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary, very, very, very brilliant and very popular, popular photographs. Um, this splash motif was used by British Marketing Board on its tankers at one point, and I went up to the depot near Oxford and said, are people recognizing what this corona is? And they said, well, no, not really. And it didn't survive as a, as a motif on the milk vans for all that long. Now, who owned Darcy Thompson's book? Darcy Thompson's book came out in a two-volume edition in 1945. It was continually re-edited, not so much for its consumption in biology, but for its consumption in other fields. Jackson Pollock. He owned the 1945 edition. This is Jackson Pollock in 1946. Now, I'm not for a moment saying the dripping came about was of Darcy Thompson, but you can see what his interest would be in how different viscosities behave, different paints, different uh, level uh, ratios of pigment to solvent, house paints, ink. I think there's probably some ink in, the, in this. So it's a question, the theory, we talked a little bit um, over dinner one night about where theory comes in. And I said it could come in anywhere. It needn't come in at the foundational stage. It can come in and help articulate what the artist is doing. And I think this is exactly what is happening here. Um, the Jackson Pollock scholars, I don't think, have taken on board at all that uh, in Jackson Pollock's library there is the two-volume edition of Darcy Thompson, which discusses the behaviour of viscous and non-viscous fluids. And a translation of it into glass very nicely. Um, on the left at the bottom, that's the page from Darcy Thompson at the top, on the left at the bottom, Mark Bickers, who was producing this splash glass um, looking remarkably like the polyp, I think he must have known of this. I don't know Mark Vickers personally. But this is for large-scale um, glass manufacture. On the, the one in the bottom right, which the University of Virginia Press chose as the cover illustration, this is actually formed by an analogous process. This is Charlotte Sale, and she would make the, make the glass, and around the edge she put a translucent slip, which she then clips away, to create these, um, these little, little patches of slip, and then she twists it very quickly. So this is actually formed by, um, by, by the spinning, by a centrifugal force, and uh, is a kind of splash in a way. I think very beautiful. And of course, it works beautifully in glass because you've got that sense of how, how water will flow, how a fluid, a fluid will flow. And somewhat surprisingly, David Hockney. Uh, we know that H David Hockney, and I had long, long com correspondence with him, some of which is published, about his ideas of optical imitation in old master paintings. Uh, but here, the bigger splash, which we think of as not a very scientific image, but the one in the bottom 
the lower left-hand corner is David's photograph <coughs> taken in a swimming pool. And it, 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 it's extraordinarily beautiful and effective, but I think it also raises the question as to whether if we didn't know a photograph, we would actually read that splash rather well, as well as we do. I think to some extent, we got a photographically cultivated vision of some of these things, like horses running. Um, we now accept that their legs do all sorts of eccentric things, and they don't do that, as in some of the earlier paintings. But, um, so I think photography itself actually does condition what we think we see. Not literally physiologically what we think we see, but psychologically what we, what we see and get out of something. And continuing the theme of splashes, Charles Vernon Boys in uh, 1905 wrote a popular book on bubbles. Um, I've got a chapter in the book which largely centers on bubbles. Um, what's happening in the top corner there, there's a stroboscopic device as a, of a turning wheel, and there's a tuning fork, and there's a squirt of water going up in a parabolic arc. And the the tuning fork is tuned to coincide at the same frequency as the, uh, as the stroboscopic light is going on and off. And what you end up by seeing is a series of separate, separate drips. The, the, light, the, the arc breaks down into these separate blobs. And Susan Durgis, and this is, she was the one who did the alchemical work, each of these acts as a little lens, so you see her presence actually in these little lenses reflected there. Um, depending upon your tuning, the, the drops could seem to march upwards or downwards. It depends if they're in phase or not. And she calls this the observer and the observed. And as I said, she was rather, rather well read about these things. And it's a metaphorical illustration of the idea that the scientist is embedded in the illustration, in the, in the phenomenon. That the observation itself and the observer as is commonplace in, 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 in thinking about uh, uh, theoretical physics, is actually a part of that. Um, it's, she's using the science which Boyce knew about um, uh, very brilliantly, but then using it metaphorically. One of the great differences between art and science imagery is that art imagery relies a lot upon metaphor and analogy in a very suggestive way. Um, the scientists may use that uh, uh, along the way of getting somewhere, but it's not part of the final formulation. And a particularly nice example of a splash, Andy Goldsworth, he, um, again in the Scottish borders, and he goes out each day and makes a work of art in nature. It keeps him honest. He will use all sorts of materials, sometimes ephemeral ones, and one of the things he did, he did a series of throws, which he was interested in the splashing, and then he started uh, agitating the water more vigorously. And what he found, he got a rainbow um, on a sunny day. Unsurprisingly, but uh, he wasn't looking for that. And suddenly it became the rainbow which interested in him. And this is, for me, a wonderful uh, metaphor for how we discover things. Often, and this happens in science a lot, you're looking at something and you see something and then suddenly it's over there. It's actually not what you're looking at, which is interesting. It's this other thing. And I think artists do that all the time, don't they? That in the studio, you're doing something uh, and you think concentrating on it. And some, sudden, suddenly there's a bit of noise. Yeah. And one person's noise is someone else's primary phenomenon. Um, so this, this, this has a kind of moral for me, which I, I think is pretty nice. And uh, and uh, a work by Annie Catterall just installed in uh, Oxford Brookes University, just up the road from uh, just up the road from uh, where I work. And the, these hang from a ceiling, and I've got a time lapse uh, image which I hope will work. If it doesn't, then. We'll be struggling. No, these are not running. Anyway, this is looking up at the ceiling, and it consists of a series of pretty much invisible nylon threads with these uh, watery elements which then move in the air in a, in a, in a circulatory, circulatory fashion. I'll see at the end of the lecture if I can get these um, 
to run direct off my desktop in some way. Um, it's frustrating that they're not running. Oh, yes, it is running now. Yeah. There we are. Can I control it? But I don't. What I'm not getting is a control bar. I don't want to work through the whole of this. It takes rather a long time. No, we just have to grin and bear it, I'm afraid. They mount the, the, the glass elements and so on. They're all mounted up into the ceiling and they're, they're gradually let down. Um, I think probably I, I won't go on with that. And that is the final result. Anyway, I'm sorry, that's rather disappointing and doesn't make a very good effect, but there we are. <laughs> and in my sort of spirit of irresponsibility, this is Saturn seen from below. Um, these analogies are, in a sense, sort of light-hearted and trivial, but I do find them rather appealing. And uh, the, f the final of my uh, characteristics is folding. Um, we take something like that, which is a piece of linen dropped casually and folded as just what happens, but they're actually miracles of construction. Every form and force there is resolved within the skin of the material within the material itself. It needs nothing to hold it up. And a lot of, a good number of modern architects have used exactly that property. Um, you could know about it before, but you need quite a lot of computing powers. You can't, sim can't simply do this in concrete and assume it stands up. Um, but uh, folding has become a major element in, uh, in, in contemporary architecture. And of course, it was a major element in Renaissance painting. I have to go back to a Leonardo starting point. If you think about it, up until the 18th century, probably draperies occupy more square meterage of painting uh, than any other feature of painting, including skies, I think, probably. Um, there's Leonardo Annunciation and Giovanni Bellini Madonna. The Leonardo um, studied, it, this is linen draped, uh, infused with clay and draped over a lay figure to give this um, form which he, could, which he could study. Anyway, to the, in terms of modern architecture, the first of the major folders was Frank Gehry. Um, Gehry developed the technique during his work on the Lewis house. Lewis was a, a motor insurance magnate who commissioned Frank Gehry to do a house which has never been finished but Lewis was willing to let his project be the research uh, forum, the research laboratory, as it were, for Frank Gehry's growing interests in folding. Um, a key moment came when, when they folded, and the, the Lewis house was becoming a series of sort of separate um, elements, and they weren't getting any unity in them. And then uh, one night, uh, somebody draped a piece of velvet over them, and they got that extraordinary configuration. That was then set in plaster of Paris and became um, the beginning of Frank Gehry's um, folded architecture. Gehry is very articulate about folding in historic paintings and historic works, and he knows this, the tomb of Urban VIII in the Vatican with this amazing, uh, amazing piece of folded rock. Uh, it's very much articulated, again, in relation to uh, 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 literacy and historic art. And of course, um, Bill Bow was the, the, Guggen the Guggenheim, Bill Bow was the, the great uh, burst of, of the folded architecture onto the scene. In this case, um, folded with echoes of the prows of boats and waves and so on. Uh, once more, a, a work of art and taking an architecture as a work of art can have all these metaphorical and associational things um, going on with them. Gary as a folder is not as ambitious as some of the younger artists because there's a terrific amount of, uh, of uh, girder work holding up all this. The pure folders don't like Gary's girder work. They, they, they want it to stand up on its own, on its own 
on, on its own, uh, in its own respect. And somebody, again, I've been in, involved with Cecil Balmont, who was the chief engineer at uh, Ove Arup, the great, uh, the great engineering firm. And he ran an advanced geometry group as part of the firm. And the people at the conference, you, it's, uh, you've been talking about geometry and teaching. Um, anyway, he had an advanced geometry group doing incredibly complicated computational geometry and they would be working on these forms and when, once they got a form that looked promising, they'd take it out and they'd model it in paper. And then they'd go back into the computer. There's this dialogue between a really very, very basic old-fashioned technique of hand modeling and these very advanced techniques. Um, does anybody recognize this bridge? Coinborough, indeed, yes, exactly. You from there? Yes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Coinborough Bridge, I can't pronounce it properly, and I'll mangle the, the name. This is, um, this is Cecil Balmond with Adeo, Adeo da Fonseca. Can you say it properly? Uh, yeah, that will do. Yeah, nicely, thank you. <laughs> um, it's a footbridge, and what Cecil wanted to do was to create this wonderfully elegant bridge, but to create a pause in the middle, so the two ends of the bridge come at each other, and they come up, and they suddenly have to swerve and merge. Um, and oh, to the left, the bridge surface is cantilevered out in that way, and to the right, it's cantilevered out in the other way. And it's, it's very difficult to photograph. But very beautiful, actually, and I've not been to Coinborough, but uh, anyway, my intention is to come and experience it at some point. Um, you can get a sense there in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, and more on the right, that's the platform. So it's a mental pause, it's a physical pause, but generally bridges, including foot bridges, just go shoof. But this one goes, and there's that graceful moment, uh, graceful moment in the middle. So this is a, a rather simple folding, but the, the actual structural properties of the bridge are uh, a state of the art of, uh, of computed, computed, engineer, computed engineering. But alongside all this high-tech stuff, there's still an enormous room for old-fashioned techniques. Uh, this is Alison Watt, who began as a portrait painter and gradually became more and more interested in the draperies rather than... They're still portraits, but they're not portraits with faces in them, as it were. And this was erected in the Edinburgh Festival one year in the old church of St. Paul's in Edinburgh, and it's called Still, four big canvases of a white drapery. There's actually a lot of color in this. To get white looking good, you need quite a lot of control of color. And it was so popular. This is a memorial chapel. It's a war memorial chapel. And it was immensely popular with the people who used it, and it stayed there. It's become, as it were, requisitioned. Uh, and it has, it's folding and it's folded cloth, but it has enormous richness of potential association. It opens up a field of interpretation. We can think of the virgin, we can think of a veil, we can think of a shroud. Um, it's non-prescriptive, but it, for people praying uh, in this memorial chapel, it, uh, it, do, it did a very extraordinary job. Um, Alison Watt has also now been experimenting with, uh, with dark ones, like uh, dark matter in the universe, even more mysterious and, uh, and very suggestive. Um, so this is standard paints, standard canvas, and standard brushes, but uh, doing a, a very remarkable job in an old medium, but uh, feeding into this uh, interest in folding. And just my last result, remarks come out of this, and it's about the role of the spectator or the reader in the case of a, of a scientific um, article. Um, I look at a lot of things where the art and science is doing not dissimilar things. They start at the same point. And I think the real differentiation is the output, the final result which is produced. The artist is making a field for interpretation. And those of you who are artists know you can't control the interpretation. You can shape it. Obviously, it's not arbitrary. But you're basically inviting the viewer in and asking them to make what they will of it. A scientist writing an article isn't doing that. You, you may misinterpret what they're saying, but that's not the idea. 
the idea is to be fairly definite. And I can, do it meta I can do it visually by saying, well, Leonardo in the bottom right is interested in the science of vision. Um, that's the one of obviously is from the internet, and it simply shows the anatomy of an eye in a very schematic way, and it's either right or wrong. A Mona Lisa's eye, Leonardo referred to the eye as the window of the soul. So in art, you could have this metaphorical, suggestive, open-ended uh, sense. Uh, the scientists are not wanting to open things up in that way. If they do, then uh, the, the article or book or whatever is, is not the same. So my feeling is that you've got these intuitions about a whole series of things about physical phenomena. Sometimes it's almost somatic, sometimes it's visual, sometimes it's tactile, all sorts of intuitions of experiences. And what you can then do with them as an artist and scientist is often very different, but there is this underlying sense of intuition about how nature works and how nature works in terms of pattern and geometry. Okay, thank you.